Hub, and Spoke. Audio Collective. What's that? It's the sound of our first ever Hub and Spoke Independence Day fundraiser. Help us light the fuse to support independent audio and toss us $4, $44, $144, let's go nuts. End it in four, we'll take it. Stay tuned to the end credits for more information or give now at hubspokeaudio.org slash July 4, get it? Or click on the link in the show notes. But first, the episode. a young woman, maybe in her early 20s or late teens, she seems quite young, and she's standing quite plainly in a long flowing white dress. And it's long and rectangular, so it just really shows like the length of the lady. It's quite beautiful. And her hair, this brilliant red colored hair, kind of disheveled, it's not neatly Coiffed, I guess. Striking red hair. It's almost like a fox's hair. She's holding a white flower in her left hand. Behind her is uh, looks like maybe very thick white curtains. She's almost fading into the curtain, but uh, her red hair really makes her stand out. Um, so you get the sense that she's got a lot of power and strength to be all in white and standing out against her white backdrop. She looks very, almost similar to, I guess, a person today, but the dress is definitely, like, of that time. Uh, it's got long sleeves and white cuffs, and the sleeves are a, has a little more gray in it. There's a belt around the, the bodice, is that what you call that, with a, um, with a bow. Well, it looks like silk. Reminds me almost of a waterfall. It's like the, the froth just kind of cascading down, although it's very long and straight, doesn't have a lot of lace or, or ripples, but it sort of has that falling look. The dress looks kind of like a wedding dress. It looks very religious, kind of reminiscent of the dresses that people put their children in to be christened or baptized or for their first communion. I don't know, maybe a prom dress of the time? She's, she's going to the prom. <laughs> So with, with the white dress and the flowers, it kind of makes me feel like maybe a spurned lover, you know, someone who was jilted at the altar. She has kind of a far away look, like she's contemplating something. Either just woke up or maybe going to bed. You're standing on the edge of a lake and there's this like angelic female being that's like, kind of wispy at the edges, so a little ethereal that's coming to you from across the lake to tell you something, to warn you something. She disappears into the smoke. I mean, classic purity, chastity, virginity. It makes her seem kind of fierce, like she's so angelic and beautiful and pure, but she's has kind of conquered this wolf on the on the ground. She's standing on a a rug that disturbs me because it's a dead animal. <laughs> I see a dog hiding in the carpet. And he's also staring at me, like also kind of asking, what are you doing here? I am very actively trying to avoid the wolf, bear kind of thing that's there. It's really not doing it for me. I don't know if it's a bear skin or a wolf skin rug. And that rug is on top of a like, antique type blue and white. Persian rug. And there are some flowers on the bear between her dress and the bear's face in the foreground. Um, she's even dropped some flowers onto the wolf. Uh, so it's sort of like her dropping the mic on this wolf that she's um, sort of very casually conquered. All we get to see of their lives is like this, this particular picture. So it just makes me think about like what their lives were like, what it looked like. They were so young and got to sit for these incredible painters, but, but what else do we know about their lives? And I don't know anything. This is The Lonely Palette, the podcast that returns art history to the masses one object at a time. I'm Tamara Vishai. Episode 63, 
James Abbott McNeil Whistler's Symphony in White, number one, The White Girl, from 1862. So let's run an experiment together. How much can you tell about a person by their signature? Okay, shush, this is science. Let's go with it. What does your signature say about you? How to tell your true personality from your signature? 14 types of signatures you must avoid. Oh, okay, this is fun. If your signature is unclear, you are arrogant. If it's underlined, you lack confidence. A short signature means you're impatient. That's totally me. A period means you're a titan of industry. An upward slant means you think about the future. Ah, a butterfly with a long stinger. You are a painter of incredible aesthetic subtlety and quiet grace who goes out of his way to approach the world with the kind of smug combativeness that even has Oscar Wilde telling you to tone it down a notch. Hmm. So, in other words, hey, Muhammad Ali, the American expat Gilded Age painter James Abbott McNeil Whistler called. He wants his motto back. So, Maybe I'm late to the party here, but I didn't realize that Whistler was such a piece of work. I mean, his paintings are so quiet and serene and lovely. His colors, in the words of the late great New Yorker art critic Peter Sheldahl, look as though they were, quote, exhaled onto the canvas. This is the same painter who is known for a portrait of his mother that has gone down in art history as one of the most Victorian, dowdy, and humorless renderings of a woman ever committed to canvas. And this is also the same painter who could render a woman in a white dress who is totally unpretentious, and yet as elegant and exquisite as a bride. But you guys, we should have noticed the growling wolfskin rug that she's standing on top of. This painting, Symphony in White, number one, The White Girl, was painted a full decade before Whistler perfected and started implementing his infamous stinging butterfly signature. But the message is still there, loud and clear. By all means, it says, admire the languid beauty of Whistler's paintings, but don't cross him. The story of Whistler is best told as a story, starting at the beginning and moving chronologically through his life, where, like we saw with Caravaggio in episode 60, the paintings of a very public punk responded to that punk's circumstances. Whistler was born in 1834 in Lowell, Massachusetts, although he decided later on to claim that he had been born in St. Petersburg, Russia, where he later moved at the age of eight, claiming that, quote, I shall be born when and where I want, and I do not choose to be born in Lowell. Burn. So that really gives you the sense of the kind of kid he was. Moody and unfocused, brilliant and obnoxious. It was in St. Petersburg, where his father was transferred to design the railroads for Nicholas I, where Whistler first started taking private art lessons. And at age 10, his mother was given the report from a noted artist that, quote, your little boy has uncommon genius, but do not urge him beyond his inclination, end quote. He lived up to that advice, imagining an art career, but making a pit stop beforehand at West Point Military Academy, where he was skillful both at drawing maps and the little caricatures of mermaids and whales in the margins, and was then summarily kicked out for being sarcastic, rebellious, and growing his curly hair too long like a damn beatnik. He packed his bags, moved to Paris to pursue art professionally, and never came back to the United States. Once in Paris, Whistler fell in with the kind of set you'd imagine for a rebel artist without a cause. Gustave Courbet, Henri Fantin Latour, Edouard Manet, and the poet Charles Baudelaire, who actually very much identified a cause for them all to explore, modernism itself. We've looked before at the origins of modernism in mid-19th century Paris, particularly when we looked at Sargent in episode 11, 
where the most important and revolutionary characteristics of painting were, quite simply, to show how secular, how ordinary the subject of painting could be. After centuries of church control, biblical narrative, mythological allegory, and the inner turmoil of the post-Enlightenment romantics, and we covered that in episode 18, what could be more revolutionary than showing life exactly as it was? That is, boring, mundane. The movement later classified as realism aimed to simply show reality, life being lived in all of its unvarnished truth. Baudelaire challenged artists to scrutinize the world, life, nature, and depict it faithfully, without heroics, flowery descriptions, rhetoric. And so you end up with paintings that can seem, on their surface, kind of meh. People going about their business, going to work, hanging laundry, sharing a pint. They're kind of boring. That is, until you realize how brave a statement these artists were making. How revelatory they were in opening up painting to the masses and the classes. That is, for the first time ever, the lower classes, the working classes. Take Courbet's Burial at Ornan from 1849, a huge history painting for modern times. It's a bleak funeral in the rural French town of Ornan, focusing on unidealized, mostly working class mourners. The painting's composition is intentionally off kilter, but the figures are still in a line, mostly interacting with one another, except for the few staring right at us, which implicates us as participants. We are present at this grim scene, standing in front of the unceremonious hole in the center, that is, the grave, which is cut off. Whoever's going in it is not the point. Which is the case, Courbet seems to be saying, for so many people. And maybe there's something heroic about acknowledging that, and especially rendering it on a 22-foot-long canvas. This is a political act, drawing attention to a socioeconomic population that has been historically overlooked. And Courbet has largely been seen as a political painter. But something else happens, too, when you're painting things as they are, without sentimentality or morality or even real commentary. Something happens that's not political at all, even if it's also revolutionary. Another poet-philosopher of the group, Théophile Gautier, was considered the founder of what would become the aesthetic movement, where Whistler ultimately found his home. Gautier popularized the phrase l'art pour l'art, art for art's sake, meaning that art doesn't need to have some higher purpose, some didactic lesson, some moral takeaway. Instead, it can be independent of, in Whistler's words, quote, all that claptrap, it can just be beautiful. It can stand alone. It can, as Whistler continues, quote, appeal to the artistic sense of eye or ear without confounding these with emotions entirely foreign to it as devotion, pity, love, patriotism, and the like, end quote. You know, the demons you must slay to achieve success, as Mr. Burns would say. Furthermore, the capital A aesthetics continued, the artist's responsibility was not to society or to nature, but to himself. If he has the opportunity to improve upon the world he sees, it's his job to do so, for, quote, nature is very rarely right. Of course, we have a paradox here. How can an artist both be true to the natural world without embellishment and believe that it's his responsibility to improve upon it? And hold that thought because we'll come back to it. But whether or not you believe that, hypothetically, art that is divorced from all social, societal, or human sentiment is a good thing, or even possible, it's interesting to look at the actual paintings of the aesthetic movement 
the paintings that they believed embodied these values. Because for all of their disconnect, this art is by no means robotic or fascist. In fact, it's really, really beautiful. These paintings focus on color and line, movement and grace. And to accentuate these characteristics, Whistler named the bulk of his paintings for music, symphonies, arrangements, nocturnes, all alluding to the same sense of the coming together of individual instruments in an orchestra, or the aesthetic conventions on a canvas, with the aim of creating a harmonious whole. In fact, Whistler's mother, from 1871, is actually titled Arrangement in Gray and Black No. 1, and is meant not as an exercise in drab filial devotion, but monochrome in paint. It's first and foremost about aesthetics. He uses an intentionally constrained, austere palette to capture the diversity of shapes, while still rendering the unvarnished specificity of her face and her hands and the lacy bonnet and handkerchief as they emerge, contrasting, from the large black mass of her dress. It's wonderfully reminiscent of another dowdy crone in black, Degas' Aunt Fanny from a year later, which we looked at in episode four. Reminiscent not just because of the grim expressions of the sitters who look as though they'd rather be anywhere else, but because these portraits aren't telling their stories, so much as the story of the entire movement that they find themselves in. But okay, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. Let's jump back a decade to where we left Whistler and his buddies in Paris in the mid-1850s, and then to London, where he moved permanently in 1859, although he traveled back to Paris frequently after that. The constrained palette and musical titles, which we would later see in Whistler's Mother, were part of his work from the jump. And this becomes clear when we come to our painting of the day, and his first big famous splash onto the scene, Symphony in White, Number One, The White Girl, from 1862. It's an absolute stunner, standing at seven feet tall, a beautiful girl with large green eyes and long red hair worn loose, stands in a simple, elegant, cream-colored dress, holding a simple, elegant flower against a simple, elegant, cream-colored backdrop, standing on a bearskin rug atop an understated blue oriental rug. And what all of this simple elegance amounts to is that it's an artwork that is meant to tell the story of artistry and nothing else. The woman is a passive, decorative figure, not actively participating in a narrative. Instead, just a model who has dropped her pose at the end of a long session, her hair down, and dressed in the 19th century equivalent of a housecoat. This moment is realistic in that she's no one, and actually very much someone. That is, a woman named Joanna Hiffernan, who was Whistler's primary model for a decade. Hiffernan was an Irish expat artist herself, who managed his studio and his financial affairs, who was his power of attorney and his sole financial heir, and who even ended up raising his illegitimate son, not hers, in 1870 until her death in 1886 at the age of 52. The point is, when you consider the role of figures in paintings, you expect her to be both playing a narrative role, you know, goddess, queen, wife, and to have no external life outside the frame. A painting that honors realism subverts both of these expectations. Here is a real person who, for the purposes of the painting, is simply a model, simply showing that a painting can be fundamentally about capturing a figure and her simple, elegant space harmoniously. But for a painting that was meant by design to say so little, it certainly got tongues a waggling. It was rejected by both the Royal Academy in London and the Salon in Paris, although it was eventually accepted by the Salon de Refusé, the Salon of the Refused, 
an independent exhibition spearheaded by Courbet and his friends in 1863. Whistler exhibited this painting alongside Manet's infamous Déjeuner sous l'herbe, Luncheon in the Grass, and the pair of paintings got into their fair share of mischief. Art for its own sake was still a revolutionary idea, especially as it played out in realism. Manet's scandal came from the merging of model and real life, the naked, not nude woman in the grass lunching with clothed men, which, as with many of the paintings that got Manet in trouble, was a trope that was actually borrowed from art history, specifically Titian's pastoral concert from around 1509. But the difference is that here, it's been given Manet's trademark cringy little spin. The woman is not an allegory or an apparition or a goddess, but most likely a very real prostitute, alluding to the very real reality of the mid-century French bourgeoisie, which was not something they wanted to talk about in polite company or have displayed on their hallowed salon walls. Still, the painting's infamy helped to boost Whistler's. Both paintings were seen by critics as making a big capital S statement with their subject matter. And Manet's did make a statement about art history, about contemporary audiences, about class. But Whistler's painting did not. No big statement. It was just supposed to be art for its own sake. No matter what those fucking critics said. Now, why it was so important for critics to pull meaning out of this painting honestly isn't really our concern here. Beyond the fact that Victorian-era critics, as we've discussed, were used to paintings meaning things. But for our purposes, what this criticism really did was solidify Whistler's hatred of critics, who honestly seemed to willfully ignore what he was trying to do. Which, as you can imagine, what you already know about him just pissed him off more. Because what they did was look for every bit of allegorical meaning that they could squeeze from his paintings. Paintings that he already said, with Seinfeldian assurance, were about nothing. The girl in white is a formalist exercise not unlike how he would later describe the portrait of his mother. Quote, my painting, he said, simply represents a girl in white standing in front of a white curtain, end quote. But, oh no no, the critics said. It was about a ghost, a bride, maybe a ghost bride, definitely about innocence lost. I mean, see the virginal white lily? See the lusty masculine bearhead? Hell, maybe she's the Virgin Mary. Maybe she's the heroine of Wilkie Collins' novel, The Woman in White. A book that Whistler said, adamantly, he had never read. His pushback against his critics culminated in an actual libel lawsuit in 1877 against the noted Victorian critic John Ruskin. And we've talked about Ruskin before, mostly to point out what a mimsy priss he was. But here, it finally got him and his criticism going forward in trouble. It stemmed from his review of Whistler's Nocturne in Black and Gold, The Falling Rocket, from 1875, a pluming abstract painting of fireworks in nighttime, which was priced at the relatively steep amount of 200 guineas. What impudence, Ruskin wrote, to ask for that kind of a sum for, quote, flinging a pot of paint in the public's face, end quote. Whistler took Ruskin to court and, incredibly, won, changing the face of art criticism pretty much permanently, as now critics, who had previously been seen as the voice of truth, even the voice of God, were now actually seen for what they were, the voice of a man, subjective, with opinions that were formed by their own preferences, their own movements. It's not the fault of aesthetics like Whistler that Ruskin came up Victorian and held painting to Victorian standards. And guess what? It's not Ruskin's fault either. But I should also be clear. 
In this battle between an artist and his critic, there's no real winner here. Because the critics had a point when they held Whistler to account for the ambiguities, even contradictions, in his philosophy. Remember that central paradox. How an artist squares the circle of being both true to the natural world without embellishment and believes that it's his responsibility to improve it. Spoiler, he doesn't square it. He just paints it. And that's what the critics noticed. That said, there were other times that they just seemed to be messing with him, willfully ignoring what he did well and kicking his hornet's nest. Like when they pointed out that for a painting that was all about aesthetics, in his third in the series of symphonies in white, he featured a woman in a yellow dress. And I'm with Whistler on this one, when he asks if they also expect a symphony in the key of F to only contain the F note. That said, if Whistler is going to claim that his work is purely aesthetic, purely about color and form and completely divorced from society, how does he account for the clear influence of the British pre-Raphaelites in his painting of Joanna Hiffernan and in his other women in white paintings that depict women who lie languidly with their long faces and brilliant eyes and rich, loose hair and who absolutely positively reference the very same Bible stories and allegories that occupy the pre-Raphaelite canvases, a movement that, it should be said, was particularly beloved by, you guessed it, John Ruskin. Whistler was a known friend and admirer of Dante Gabriel Rossetti, the El Jefe of the pre-Raphaelites. He knew what he was referencing and he knew what they were referencing. And this is why Whistler's victory over Ruskin hasn't gone down as an unmitigated success for artists everywhere. Whistler's attitude essentially served to ruin his own reputation, at least while he was alive. He just couldn't seem to keep a friend, really, besides Joanna Hiffernan. He was a great buddy to Oscar Wilde, and even credited for some of Wilde's best singers, only to lose him in a series of public spats, which itself culminated in Wilde, quote, symbolically murdering him, by basing the doomed artist character of Basil from the picture of Dorian Gray on Whistler. And I'm not going to spoil it entirely, but suffice to say, his murder is described with a side of relish. Poor guy. It takes a particular kind of self-centered waspishness to lose the bitchy conspiratorial confidence of Oscar freaking Wilde. And yet, quote, Whistler, Wilde wrote, spelled art with a capital I. And I, for one, am still kind of surprised by all of this. Even though I see Whistler's signature and the bear under Joanna's feet, and almost feel like I should have seen it coming. But I didn't, and you probably didn't either. And to that end, it's remarkable how Whistler's reputation in his afterlife doesn't seem to precede him, or even define him. His paintings, divorced from his person, are simply gorgeous. They are true examples of what happens when you remove an artwork from commentary, politics, even the punkish piccadillos of the artist. They just become shapes, line, arrangements, symphonies, artistry, even if they're existing in a very real world. And to that end, I'm grateful to know this background to understand the stingers and barbs and slings and arrows that make Whistler's humane style of painting also deeply human. This feels like real realism. The reality of a painting can also be the reality of a model who is tired of posing and just wants to get back to her life. Great art and great artists can contain both butterflies and bees. And maybe there's something heroic about acknowledging that.
Special thanks to Debbie Bleacher, roving correspondent Melissa Galvez, and the intrepid museum goers at the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. For more information, past episodes, and all the images, go to thelonelypalette.com, where you can also learn more about commissioning episodes, buying merch, signing up for our monthly newsletter, and booking virtual museum tours with yours truly for a summer office team building exercise that your coworkers will actually want to attend. You can also learn more about supporting the show at patreon.com slash lonelypalette. No amount per episode is too little, and you really do keep the lights on here. One more time, that's patreon.com slash lonelypalette. The Lonely Palette is a proud founding member of Hub and Spoke, a collective of idea-driven and now donation-seeking independent podcasts. That's right, our Independence Day fundraiser is in full swing. We've claimed the 4th of July as our own in honor of independent audiomakers everywhere. And why support independent creators? Because maybe you just found out that all your favorite producers got laid off. Maybe you want audio that isn't beholden to corporate interests and politics. Maybe you find that all corporate podcasts kind of sound the same. And this is why you listen to us, right? For the messy, offbeat, pure podcasting that only comes from being completely and totally independent. So support our mission at hubspokeaudio.org slash July 4, or go to the link in the show notes and thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And after that intro, there is no better episode to plug than the latest episode of Open Source with Christopher Lydon, the world's first podcast, interviewing our very own Erica Heilman of Rumblestrip, recipient of the world's first Peabody Award by an independent show. I am honored to work with them and proud to share their conversation with you. Check it out at radioopensource.org, hubspokeaudio.org, or wherever you get your podcasts.